So there's two readings today. The first one is in Matthew 5, 27 to 32. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. It has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, makes her the victim of adultery, and anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. The second reading is from 1 Corinthians 6, verses 12 to 20. I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. You say, food for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy them both. The body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and he will raise us also. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said, the two will become one flesh. But whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Flee from sexual immorality. All of the sins a person commits are outside the body. But whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks so much, Sarah. Not the easiest uh, passages that we're unpacking today. Uh, Let's pray and invite Jesus, the Lord who loves us, to be with us. Lord, we thank you for your deep love for us. We thank you for what you are doing in us. We thank you that you acknowledge and see each of us. And Lord, as we grapple, after having heard those passages, as we hear your story, Lord, I pray you would work in our hearts, that we would take the truth that you are bringing to us. Lord, anything that's just of me, let it fall away. But Lord, would you speak your truth to our hearts? Would you do work with us today as we seek to be even better disciples, even better brothers and sisters of Christ? As we seek to follow you in all things, Jesus, would you be so present? And I pray particularly after the words we hear, Lord, that you would come, you would move, that we would experience that just indescribable love that you have for each and every one of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, uh, I've spent months in preparation for this morning. Uh, I've read and listened to many books, uh, articles around the subject, which adds to years of reading and study uh, to be carefully balanced um, in what I say, in what I believe the Lord calls preachers to preach faithfully. Um, And on Wednesday, I had a a nice, neat, clear sermon. It had taken hours. I was there. I was ready. I felt it was pastorally sensitive and rooted in scripture. But then Thursday morning, something still, uh, something moved. So I felt the Lord um, just saying, write a different one, (laughs) write a different sermon. Um, I felt the sermon was was good. Uh, I think I I felt that the Lord say, um, uh, instead of what I prepared to tell you the story, um, the story of God, the story of God, where sex falls in and fits in within the story of God. my, script, uh, my prayer is that you're able to enter into the great drama which God has blessed us with. 
Um, I've produced a handout, which is uh, at the moment, it's at the back um, as you head out. Please do feel free to take it. It has resources. It's the, it's the notes. It's not the finished notes, but it is, it is the notes of the sermon that I was ready to preach. And there's some helpful things in there, particularly that front page. I'd love everyone to take one if you can on the way out. Um, that would be great. Um, but this is what I feel the Lord uh, has put on my heart. But some things bef- uh, I need you to, to hear before I go any further. Uh, firstly, and if we can have this on the slide, please. Firstly, everyone is welcome in St. Mark's. Everyone is welcome. And Jesus welcomed uh, radically. So everyone is welcome. Secondly, every person is made in the image of God. We are all created by God. We are made in his image That is essential to state at the beginning. Thirdly, every person is loved by God. Everyone is given an invitation to this love. And fourthly, church must be a place, safe place for all. I hope this is the start of a conversation that we can have together. I hope St. Mark's will be a place where you can be open and honest and be you um, as we all look to being faithfully Uh, faithfully follow Jesus in all we do so are you ready in the beginning there was God God the Father God the Word and God the Holy Spirit three members in one complete essence united in the most intimate love that has ever and ever will be known God the Father spoke through God the Word, the heavens and the earth into being. The land and the sea, the birds in the air, the fish in the oceans. And God the Holy Spirit hovered over the waters of the creation which he had birthed. To crown all of creation, God created creatures to know his love, to experience his blessing and to enter into a covenant relationship which would demonstrate to these particular creatures the intimate nature of God himself. God the Father, God the Word, and God the Holy Spirit. So out of his love, he created a man and a woman. He carefully designed them, crafted them different yet complementary. In fact, he created them to join spiritually and emotionally through the most physical union that two humans could ever engage in. At the beginning of the human race, God created us sexual beings with a design and careful intention. The first man and woman lived with God. They experienced an intimacy with God daily, which they took for granted. They knew nothing else. And God loved walking with them, doing life with them. That was how he intended them to live. They were completely uh, naked, completely starkers, and it didn't bother them at all. There was nothing to hide. Their sexuality was on display. Their most intimate needs were met, not in the act of sex, but in the most amazing, fundamental relationship which they were created for. A relationship with the God of all. Their own sexual union was designed to make the man and the woman one. And this act was given uh, both as a symbol of the unity that they were to have with their God and as a way of reproducing. We don't see a marriage ceremony in Eden, but with God ever present, overseeing the commitment of this man to this woman, I'd call that marriage. You know the story from here. God asked them to trust him, that he had the best interest at heart for them. He called them to follow him and not themselves. But there was something else in the garden, watching them, envying them, a creature created for light, created to be the leader of heaven's worship, number two only to God himself. But he had sought the throne of heaven. He'd led a rebellion against God and enabled uh, and ended, um, uh, he'd enabled the rebellion, he'd ended up falling so far from God, the God who created him for love. 
He watched as the new crown of God's creation, this man and this woman, as they spent time with God, everything that he'd discarded, everything he yearned for, and yet had lost in his rejection of the Creator. Determined to destroy this relationship, Lucifer spoke to the woman. Did God really say that you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? Putting a doubt in her innocent mind. She tried to resist. She told him how God had allowed them to eat from any tree in the garden, save the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God had desired them to trust him, to tell them right from wrong, to trust in his definition of good and evil. She ended, we mustn't eat from it, nor touch it, or we shall die. But the crafty fallen angel said, you shall not die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. At the thought of being able to redefine their reality, grasping for independence from God's way, in a moment of defiance and rebellion, the woman took a bite from the fruit and gave it to her husband, who ate it as freely and willingly as she had. In that single moment, they broke their covenant relationship with God. The relationship they were created for. They committed an adultery of the heart, choosing their way, not trusting God's way. That's when suddenly they looked down and realized that they were naked. And they ran to hide themselves. Their open sexuality was now something to be hidden, something that was broken. When God called for them, they were hiding. When God asked the man what had happened, instead of looking out for his wife, putting her needs before his own, instead of the loving, mutual, caring relationship which they had entered into, now he put his needs first. He blamed her and he blamed God. The woman you put here, with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. God's heart was broken. His perfect creation was broken. The relationship was broken. Adultery had taken place. The faith and trust between humanity and God was broken. And the God of true love and true justice had to expel them from his presence. Fast forward to the days of Noah. The beautiful creation was broken further. As the people were no longer living in that covenant relationship with God, as they no longer experienced the fullness of intimacy with the Creator, as Satan whispered in their ears about a new God, a God who promised, uh, he promised, would give their lives meaning, a God who would give them power and status, a God who would satisfy that deep emptiness within. Through the lies and whispers of Satan, sex, instead of being something beautiful to unite a man and a woman for their entire earthly lives, a symbol of humanity, of the beautiful union between God and his, cre his people, and the, that relationship we were destined for, it all became distorted. It was used to gain power, to take advantage of others, to dehumanize God's children, and rulers and spiritual powers took sex to a much darker place instead of sex being a part of God's gift to the world it became driven by lust and power fueled by lies and self-deception God had had enough he raised Noah to be his faithful servant as God restarted afresh now later we find a man called Abram who meets God in a miraculous way looking up at the stars um, above Abram um, uh, meets with God. Um, God makes a covenant with him that he will grow to a, a new nation through him and through his wife. He promises to raise that nation through uh, this old couple through Abram and Sarah. Sarah hadn't been able to have any children throughout her life. This was a miracle to happen. They even had an angelic visitation, which some wonder if those three angels who visited were God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, perhaps visited by the Godhead 
himself. And even then, Abraham and Sarah doubted. They end up trying to make this nation happen through um, Abraham having extramarital sex with uh, Haggai, Sarah's, or Sarah, uh, uh, Sarah at that point, um, uh, maidservant, who he ends up expelling when that baby does arrive. God's children seem so broken, so far from the loving and trusting intimacy of the garden that they were created for. And it continues throughout Israelite history. That, that covenant with Abraham, Abraham, later Abraham, were equivalent to a marriage with the people of Israel. If Abraham committed his offspring to follow and be faithful to God, then they would receive this blessing his blessing, his protection. They would live under the provision of heaven. God loves them. He desires them. He longs for them. And that is why he makes the covenant vows. But through the time of Moses, Joshua, Judges, the kings, all the way through the prophets, God's people keep turning away from him. They keep rejecting his love. When they cry out for help, he is always faithful and resources them and rescues them. And then they become idolaters again, following false gods, redefining good and evil to suit themselves. The people did what was right in their own eyes and the Lord's anger was kindled against them. We find in the book of Judges. Not because God is a wrathful God, but because his people had been joined to him in an eternal covenant and yet time after time they broke that covenant with him. Through the prophets and the book of the Song of Solomon, as God pours out his love for us, he speaks strangely of a romantic love, particularly toward his people. He speaks for marriage between himself, God, and the people of Israel. And in some shocking imagery in Ezekiel 19 and 20, not for the faint of heart, he speaks of the adultery of this nation to the idols that are surrounding them in the surrounding nations. And while God is always ready for his bride to return, he allows her to walk away and experience the consequences of her sin. This is part of the explanation behind the exile of Israel to Babylon when they were taken captive. It also helps us understand when the Bible says that God is jealous for us. He has destined his people to be his bride. And when we turn away from him and listen to the voice of the enemy whispering his lies over us, God feels the rejection of adultery. While this sets it in a negative frame, the positive is that God loves us so much, so much that he has destined us to live in intimacy with him for eternity. So much that he had a rescue plan to give us a life outside of the lies of Satan if only we would accept that gift of love. The God of sex was lifted higher, promising the gift of deep fulfillment for those who ate of its promiscuous fruit. The world um, our Savior stepped into just over 2,000 years ago was one with far more sexual freedoms than we often care to remember. Maybe not under the Jewish law, but with the Romans and the Greeks around them. The Greek and Roman elites were particularly seeking to realize their desires with those who caught their eye. And the desire of the elites becomes the desire of the everyday person. What our celebrities strive for become our great ambitions. God saw his bride walking further and further away. He saw the confusion in his children. They had redefined good and evil to suit themselves. He could have left them, but his deep love displayed in wonderful affection, friendship and compassion and yes, even in some way a romantic love for us, his creation. Into that culture, our saviour was born. A man who was plain looking, a hard working labourer uh, in a poor part of Israel. A man born outside of the wedlock of his biological mother and her betrothed husband because of the most in incredible encounter between the God of creation and this faithful woman. In Jesus Christ, we see God the Word become fully human. Remember, God the Father, God the Word, or God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. 
God the Word became fully human in Jesus Christ. In Jesus, we see God the Word become fully human, living a truly human life, promising life in all its fullness, which is found in Him. Life in all its fullness, found in Him. The life of our Messiah, our rescuer, was a life of poverty, little recognized power, and a life of abstinence from sex. This is the truest human who ever lived, and he didn't cling for money, sex, or power. Sex was not a god to Jesus Christ. Jesus was fully human, he was a sexual being. He was also fully God. He was tempted in every way that we are tempted and yet he did not give in to that temptation. In so much of his teaching, Jesus addressed the lies of Satan over the world, the lies of the false god of money, which the Bible says is mammon, uh, was what it was called anyway, the lies of the false god of power and the lies of the false god of sex. Jesus never lived alone. He may have been uh, physically alone at many times, but Jesus lived in the intimacy of God. The intimacy of God. The Father, the Son and Holy Spirit, all together in that intimate space. That intimate space that Adam and Eve were designed for and destined for. That you and I are designed for and destined for. And Jesus was blessed with a community, people around him who supported him, He called the disciples to follow him, to teach them and the people they ministered to of the greatest news possible. That human fulfillment is found ultimately in God. That God is not distant, that God is pure love. Now love is not God, that's important. Love is not God, but God is love. For too long God's children had fallen, stumbling after their own definition of love of their needs being met, their desires fulfilled, their human lusts satisfied. This intimacy of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. He called into community these people around him. Uh, The good news, the greatest news to be given, that God is not distant. God is pure love. Love is not God, but God is love. Jesus teaches a love which puts others first, which longs to see the other flourish ahead of ourselves. This deep love expressed through godly relationships and godly unions, defined by the God who created us and not our broken hearts and our broken minds. He taught a high sexual ethic, one which would see a man and a woman leave their parents, family, and unite together as a sign of God's love. To live a faithful and self-giving life where just looking at a lust, at lustfully at someone else outside of that marriage is considered unfaithfulness in a way that it wasn't under the Jewish law. He was clear that's not right. It's not how God designed us to live. We're designed for faithful intimacy with God. Um, and that's shown through marriage. He had a sexual ethic which taught that divorce is not intended by God for anyone. These words will have cut to the hearts of those first listeners, his first audience. Where it was in the law of Moses, they could present, um, a man could present to his wife uh, a letter of, civil, uh, of divorce, and she would have no provision she would have no status in life anymore because of the social structures of the time. It's actually one of those places we see Jesus very much giving equality um, between men and women. Jesus' choice of sexual abstinence was to be the example for those living outside of marriage um, so that they could devote even more of their time to intimate relationship between God um, and them. That's the way that Jesus chose to live was a single life. For too long, the church at large, and I know from our exploration of living in love and faith in this church as well, singleness hasn't been celebrated. And if you're here today as a single person, I want to say thank you for journeying with us. Thank you for those moments it's been a struggle. We love you. You have such a place here. And I want St. Mark's to be a place um, where you feel 
like you fully belong. And if there's work we need to do there, please have a personal chat with me, Alison, James, or someone else um, on the PCC so that we can work to make this place even more the place it needs to be of that welcome, that love. God on earth, Jesus Christ, had come to restore and reconcile his people to himself. The mission of Jesus uh, was to bring us back into relationship with the God who loves us, the one who created us to live in this relationship with him. We hear his teaching on sex and we're as challenged as his first listeners that sex is between one man and one woman for the whole of their lives and not to be practiced outside of that. It's a, because it's a symbol of the foretaste of the marriage between God and his people, the church. The reason Jesus teaches us about the lies of Satan around money, sex and power is because he desires us. He desires us. He doesn't want us to continue living in sin any longer. He doesn't want us to have an eternity without him. He doesn't want to have an eternity without us, which is the destination of all those who are unfaithful to him. Um, if you're struggling with that as a concept, can I invite you just to read through the book of Matthew in one sitting um, or just get it, li listen to it and just see what Jesus actually says about hell. In fact, he demonstrates this love, this affection for us, this otherworldly friendship for us, the deepest compassion for us, and yes, even the most intimate romantic desire to live with us. That the God of all creation would take his place on the cross of wood to die my death. The one deserved for me as a sinner he took my place on the cross, pronounced forgiveness on those who were torturing him and killing him because he desired them as well. He desired them to be with him forever. He desired their hearts to be joined with his. It was on the cross that day that it seemed that Satan had won, the Son of God dying on the cross. And yet it was the day that the power of Satan's lies was destroyed forever. This is the God who loves us. This is the God who desires us. Whether we're united in biblical marriage or living faithful, celibate, single lives as Jesus himself did, we are called together to experience his gift of love and grace. Friends, I am a broken man. Uh, sexual brokenness has been part of my story and I shared with you a couple of years ago um, that that's been particularly in the area of pornography. I can say that having followed Jesus, asked him to do a deep work in me, to get rid of an addiction that plagued me for many, many years, the Lord brings freedom when we follow him, when we step out in faith, when we say, I don't know how this all works, but I am for you and you are for me and I want that intimate relationship. I don't want anything to get in the way. Help through um, good accountability partners, a, a loving wife. Um, that has really helped me. Having people around us who love us for who we are first and foremost, who are for us, and coming, you know, them pointing us back to Jesus, we see transformation in our lives. And that transformation is up to the Lord, what that looks like. I have found that the confusion that I have had in my life has been overturned when I have come to the Lord and said, well, how did you make me? How did you design me? Why am I here? What is my purpose when I come to him and ask for his definition of how Dan Leathers is to live life on planet Earth? My experience of God's love is that we first have to accept that he loves us and then everything else is part of our discipleship journey with him. St. Mark's needs to be a place where anyone who walks through these doors is welcomed and loved, not judged, but invited onto a discipling journey. That's what we seek here at St. Mark's. To encounter the God who loves us, who died on the cross to take away our sins. 
to bring us into the intimate relationship of God. That's why I can't do boring church, because boring church doesn't let me encounter God, or I really struggle to encounter God uh, in, in, in a very traditional setting. Now, that does work for others, and when that incense is swung for others, that will really work. For me, it's about, in, uh, well, for us, it's about encounter. That's what we seek. That's why we have so much song worship, because we seek those times of intimate encounter with the God who loved us to step into that intimate relationship and anything that gets in the way that thing we call sin just to see it fall away friends this is hard for all of us this will touch every one of our lives I long for St Mark's to be a place where you can be open about your wrestles about where we struggle to live out a biblically faithful life or even what that looks like to celebrate together where you are living faithfully for Jesus and to come alongside you as we're working it out with the Lord. But he has told us, he has spoken. It's not for us to look inwardly to try and work this out. It's for us to look up and ask him. We are called to be together. We are called to be church. We are called to be family. We are called to be uh, love to each other as Christ loves us. In the end of the story, we are coming into land. From Revelation 19, if we could have this on the screen, please, Carol. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters and like loud peals of thunder shouting, Alleluia, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride herself has made herself ready, the church. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given to her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. You are designed for God. Jesus died so that you can experience the depth of his love. Today, will you submit even your sexuality and I mean that in the general sense, your innermost desires to God. I'm going to ask the band to just come up. Um, Liz, would you play instrumentally or Sarah, just gently, just as we have some Holy Spirit time, and then as you feel led, just move us into that, that next song, that response song. Let's pray. Lord, you are the God who loves us. The God who stepped down from heaven to earth to die for me. Jesus, there's work. Jesus, there's things that I I want you to do in me. Holy Spirit, would you come and bring your life Jesus I thank you for who you have called me to be I don't want to be anyone you haven't called me to be so those things in my life which I need to do work with you now I give to you I lift to you Jesus I come to you Jesus in all I am Holy Spirit, will you come and meet me now? like prayer we have the prayer team available so please do use them